Well, hey, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight for Family Service and Guidance Center's uh, Ask a Child Therapist uh, Q&A session. Uh, pardon me if I call it real-world parenting. We've kind of taken real-world parenting. Uh, we've taken it. We, we've zhuzhed it up a little bit. It's new and improved. And we've called it Ask a Child Therapist. And really what we're focusing on is answering questions that are sent in to us by parents and caregivers and also uh, anyone that joins us, if they want to submit a question in the chat, they are more than welcome to do that. Um, I'm Jim Williamson, the Grant and Communication Coordinator for Family Service and Guidance Center. We are a community mental health center here in Topeka, Kansas, and we specialize in serving kids and families that are struggling with things like anxiety, depression, ADHD, uh, and other common pediatric mental health uh, issues. We're very excited to be offering these Q&A sessions each month because we get it. Um, being a parent is the toughest job in the world, especially now. Um, so we just want to offer some practical advice that parents can really use when it comes to some of those common challenges that kids have. Tonight, we're talking about anger management. Um, so there you go. That's what we're going to do. If you do need a certificate of attendance, uh, send me your uh, name, full name, first and last name, and your email address in the chat. Um, I would be happy to get that out to you on Monday. Uh, we also welcome your questions. If anybody has a question they want to ask, like I said, just submit that in the chat. If you don't want to submit it so that the whole room sees it, feel free to just send that to me and I will I will ask the question on your behalf. Won't mention your name, won't mention anything. I'll just ask the question. So now I want to introduce Amy Carr, licensed master's level social worker. Did I get that right? Good. Yeah, for just a few more months. <laughs> and then you're going to be Amy Carr, licensed specialist clinical social worker. So that's a big deal. And she's going to have to get new business cards and everything. So that's <laughs> um, She is a staff clinician here at Family Service and Guidance Center. And she has kindly offered to share her expertise with us tonight. Um, Amy, do you want to start off with anything? Or do you think we ought to just get right to the questions? Yeah, let's just get started. All right. Sounds good. Um, these were all questions that were submitted by parents and caregivers, just like you. Um, so you may hear some things that sound really familiar. So hopefully this will help out. Um, the first question we've got, Amy, is when my eight-year-old doesn't get his way, he starts hitting, punching, and kicking. What can I do to curb this kind of behavior? Okay, good question. So, you know, one of the things that I, I guess I want to start with is I think as parents, when that happens, we, we want to fix it right then and there. And that's just not realistic. You know, we have to work on these things outside of the behavior. So um, a couple of things to start with, you know, we are our kids' biggest teacher, model, and um, influencer, really. So um, we can teach them different coping skills. Um, which I'll talk a little bit, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go, but talking about our feelings, helping them understand, you know, um, which feelings are, are what, um, with some fun things create a anger thermometer and help show the different levels of frustration. You know, um, we start from happy, we get kind of annoyed, we get frustrated, we start to get angry, then we get really mad you know, helping them understand the different intensities, um, talking ahead of time about a calm down plan, um, you know, having some things in place for the moment, but then it's, it's kind of an ongoing thing. We, as parents, we, if we're setting limits, we also want to follow through on those consequences. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and throw in, um, you know, trying to avoid like that violent media kind of stuff you know, um, just being careful what we let our, our kids see, because I mean, that's an influence to them as well. So again, teaching, modeling, setting limits would be a great place to start. Okay, very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question, my daughter throws major tantrums over the littlest things. Can you help me understand why she does this and tell me what I can do to help her learn to manage her anger on her own? Okay. Um, so sometimes, especially when, you know, we have to stop and think where our kids are at developmentally, you know, and so um, anything under the age of five is still going to be, you know, I mean, you can kind of just expect it all. Um, 
and you're really going to have to work with them and help them regulate themselves. Um, as we get older, um, you know, they start to, to learn a little bit more and, and can do more on their own. But we have to um, also think about are there underlying issues? You know, are there other things that are causing some of the anger outbursts? So mm -hmm. there's some other mental health um, things that could be going on, ADHD, um, anxiety, depression, learning um, problems, also sensory overload. Um, I have a lot of kids that I work with that, um, you know, they'll check their shoes across the room because they're frustrated about how their sock feels you know, in that shoe, um, tags and things like that. Noises, textures can really just irritate kids out of nowhere. Um, also, we have to think about, and I touched on this a minute ago, but, you know, what skills might be lacking? Definitely, like, impulse control is something that I think we're all constantly, like, trying to kind of manage, even as adults. Um, you know, younger kids don't have those problem-solving skills, like, they they're not fine-tuned yet. Um, delaying gratification. We live in a world where we have access to just about everything immediately. And so that can be really hard, like having to wait, be patient, take turns. Um, just communicating, you know, our desires, our needs, our wants. Um, sometimes there's frustration because especially little kids don't have just the verbal language skills. And so there's a frustration. Um, let's see. And then just also like thinking about like triggers, you know, we all have different kind of triggers. Um, and so getting to know what, what those are and what, what I mean by that is, you know, I'm kind of that person that, um, I don't really like to have someone pop in their bubble gum right in my ear like that. I just don't like it. And so like knowing that that's going to make me feel a certain way, that's what I mean by a trigger. Okay. So. Those are good places to start. Yeah, okay. Uh, our next question uh, comes from a parent who says, I have a nine-year-old who throws himself into walls, hits himself in the face, tries to hurt himself when he doesn't get what he wants or if he doesn't get to do what he wants. Uh, he has even thrown himself down a flight of stairs when he didn't get his way. Dad says, I'm really worried that he's going to seriously hurt himself someday unless my wife and I can get him to stop. What should we do? You know, I think that that, I think that that is probably one of those situations where you might want to consider, you know, um, counseling. You know, I think that at some point we have to think what are, you know, what are we able to manage on our own and to keep everybody safe? And when do we need to ask maybe for more help? And so I guess I think this is a good time to talk about, you know, when, when do we ask for help? And so this is kind of one of those situations. Obviously, you know, what I said was trying to keep everybody safe. And so when you're in that moment, that's going to be the biggest thing is just trying to maybe separate if there's, you know, other children, if there's pets, um, you know, keep keeping a distance, mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely, you know, we don't want to poke the bear. So we, we want to try to just keep ourselves calm. Um, because we're focused on just safety and like calming everybody down in, in that moment. That's not when we're going to want to be, you know, very firm in no, you can't do this and whatnot, because we really just want to de-escalate at that point. But right. then I would encourage you to reach out and ask for more help. Well, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball because I think he hit on a really good point there. I think we may come to it in a later question, but, you know, sometimes we as parents, have a hard time managing our own anger or our frustration when a child is having a meltdown. Can you talk about some of the ways that we as parents and caregivers can maintain our own, you know, maintain you know, so that we don't fly off the handle when our child is flying off the hand? Yeah, so I think that happens a lot. If I really think about just myself and then everybody that comes in here that I work with, we talk a lot about this because in the, those are not easy situations, especially the example that was just given. You know, that really is a pretty, pretty scary situation. And so, you know, we may have some different reactions based on the experiences that we've had. So one, being aware of yourself, 
um, sometimes we have to walk away. You know, we, we need to take a break ourselves. We need to walk away. Maybe we need to ask if there's another adult in the home. Maybe we kind of trade off. Um, sometimes just going from one room to another room, just that change of environment can really be helpful. Um, breathing, just really, you know, that is, nobody likes to do it, but it is really just our, uh, really the best way our body, like the quickest way for us to calm down. Yeah. We don't have to do any fancy breathing, but if we can just focus on our breathing, like our body will just naturally kind of start to calm down. Um, so, so those are some, some things to do, but the, the reason we want to do that is because if we're not regulated, that part of our brain that, um, uses problem solving skills, reasoning, logic, kind of like a computer, it goes offline. We don't have access to that part of our brain. And so we're operating out of another part of our brain in which it's just based off emotions or fear. And so we're not helpful in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm getting at. So we want to make sure that we can stay calm. So we are able to be fully present to help our kiddos through that moment. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, next question. When my four-year-old gets angry, he kicks and hits. We try to put him in timeout, but he won't stay there. My question is, does timeout really work? I think that's what every parent in the world wants to know. What do you think? Yeah, so timeout was a big thing when I was a kiddo, not so much anymore. Um, you know, the first thing that I would say is, you know, asking a little one to stay somewhere by themselves, like in walking away, like just really isn't realistic. They're so curious, their attention span is very short and they're going to see something and they're going to go to it. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we, we recommend like time ends, you know, and so being present with them, you know, staying in the room with them, um, trying to, you know, really just kind of being present in that moment. Um, a couple of other things would be, um, you know, you can, um, just take a break. Instead of putting them in timeout, like just take a break from whatever you're doing. You know, that's different than timeout. Um, again, you can go back to if you kind of have a calming plan, what is that? Instead of just putting them in timeout and forgetting about them. Um, asking them, like talking to them about it, asking them what's going on. You know, you're, you're just communicating, trying to really understand. Because sometimes we, we don't always understand. It can be miscommunication. And then problem solving, giving um, different options instead of just putting them in a corner and leaving them there. That really is more of a punishment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea, like I first said, is, you know, we're teachers, you know, we want to model good behavior. And by putting them in the corner, we're not really teaching them anything. And especially with little ones, they may not understand where we've went. They might have thought we just left them, mm. which can then create some other issues. Right, right. Um, a couple of other things I um, was thinking about um, getting them to draw a picture, like sitting down and doing a different activity with them. Drawing a picture is really calming and soothing and can be fun. Um, giving a second chance. You know, talking about what happened, giving a second chance, kind of depending on the situation, mm -hmm. things that you could do too. Okay. One of the phrases you use, and I want to make sure, I think it might be helpful to some folks looking in, you talked about being present. Can you just kind of talk about that a little bit more? What, what, what does that mean? So when I say like being present, I, a couple of things come to mind. We can be present with our kids. We can um, we can go and we can be watching a movie with them. We can be having dinner with them. We can be doing an activity. But I think the the biggest thing that happens is we've got our phone with us and we're looking at our phone. We're scrolling and then we'll look over. Oh yeah, uh huh, uh huh. And then we're back on our phones. That's one example. So like, yeah, we're with them, but are we really present with them? I mean, like we need to, you know, put the phones away, put all the distractions away and focus on what's going on in front of us. Okay. 
Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, here's another question from a parent, and this is a tough situation. My son gets angry at school and it escalates very quickly to the point where he will hit his teacher and flip desks over. I'm trying to work with the school and I'm wondering what can I do at home to help with his behavior at school? Such a good question. Okay, so I there's lots of things I wanna say about this. Um, the first thing I think is we have to be honest with ourselves about our child's behavior. Okay. And I think that can be really hard. And so um, there's actually um, something I have on my door here. And I, I just want to, I want every parent to really hear me say this in that, you know, your child's behavior is a reflection of their phase of development, their ability to cope with, with their environment, their limited life experiences, and their emotional and physical state. Their behavior is not about you. And I think that especially when this happens with the schools is we take it really personal and mm -hmm. we think we start to kind of internalize and think that we're a bad parent. So um, I think that we, we can't personalize this, but we do need to be honest about what's going on. I think that sometimes what then happens is we start to defend the, the behavior that really isn't appropriate mm -hmm. and so so we don't you know we don't want to defend behavior that's bad you know like we, we really need to be honest about what's going on and if the behavior is not something that we want then we don't want to defend that because then we're also teaching kids you know that right. they're not going to make a mess <laughs> um, i cannot make any any promises What's that? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, you know, we just, we, we want to be honest about the behavior. You know, we don't want to defend them if they're in the wrong. Um, we also, we don't want to under us, like undermine the teacher's authority. Um, okay. so, even if we don't necessarily agree with something, those conversations should be separate from our, our kiddos. Right. Because if they hear us speaking negatively or commenting on something, it's going to be really difficult to manage that in the classroom. Okay. And then I think another thing is to touch on and talk to our kiddos about that life isn't always fair. Um. And so I think that that's an important thing to, to teach in, in helping them understand they are going to come across situations that, that they don't like. Um, there are injustices in the world, and we, we have to figure out how to work through them. Um, so I, I do think it's important to teach that life isn't always fair. I think that a good example is, you know, I really think, you know, kids do have jobs and that's going to school. Um, and so helping them understand that going to school is like a job. And so one way that you can help promote better behavior in school is, you know, acknowledging this is your job and that you need to learn to get along. Um, there's gonna be good people, there's gonna be bad people across, you know, in, in all settings. Um, but we've got to figure out how to work in this environment. Um, so kind of getting to consequences and, and what to do when there's an issue at school. Um, I feel like there's a couple of issues. There's functional problems and there's relational problems. So functional problems are going to be those problems that are like the inability to follow rules consistently. So that might be being late to class, the, you know, like the tardies, um, if they're not supposed to be chewing gum or being on their phones, and that's running down the halls, like that's those type of issues. Those are the issues that really the school can address. Relational issues or problems, that's where there's an inability to get along with others, an inability to respect um, the rights or property mm -hmm. of others. Um, disrespect 
threatening, those type of behaviors are when then I think we as parents really need to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that might look like um, to kind of help with that is so if they got in a, a detention because they were running down the hall, right? you go ahead and, you know, you could ask them, okay, so what are you going to do differently next time? You know, what did you learn from this? Mm -hmm. so you don't have to give a speech, just ask simple questions and then really be like, you know, um, well, you know, you, you know what you did, you made a choice, like that's life. Right. And so even though that's kind of that area that I said that the school can handle, like you could still be involved right. by, by doing that, but don't like lecture them on it. Don't drag it out. Okay. Right. The relational problems that an example of that would be like if they got suspended because of fighting mm -hmm. or something you know property damage or something like that you know it probably would be appropriate to take away maybe electronics or phone you know something worth of while to, to to our kiddos while they're suspended from school because it doesn't need to be like a fun day for them at home they're supposed to be at school but they're not there because they did something inappropriate so, you know, consequences, we use them, hopefully they're, you know, going to deter, you know, kids from doing that again. But if they're not, if they're able to stay at home and still have a bunch of fun stuff, it's not really a consequence there. Yeah. I kind of want to do that. <laughs> you know, but, but, and one of the things you mentioned, and it's, it's hard for adults sometimes as well, is the idea of life isn't always fair. And I, I think almost all of us at adults, as adults at a certain point think about things and we get mad about them, but then you have to remember life isn't fair. So I think that's something we all struggle with regardless of age sometimes. Yeah. So, okay. Um, next one, I'm worried that my daughter, and then it says 11, so I'm guessing his daughter, her daughter, his, her, whatever, uh, daughter is 11. I'm worried that my daughter will hurt one of her younger siblings or our dog when she gets mad. She gets mad, she can become violent. I'm not sure what to do. You kind of hit on this a little bit earlier too when you talked about make sure your first your first thing is making sure others and yourself are safe. Is that kind of where you would go with that? Yeah, I would say that's really similar to kind of what I talked about earlier. Again, just kind of assessing for safety, mm -hmm. um, making sure that everyone there is safe and then just really focusing on how can, how can we calm everybody down and then start, you know, we, we don't want to try to, to, to talk to people really. It's, that's not going to work. It's, it's not going to work to, to try to, to talk to someone in that yeah. moment because they just don't have the ability. So we want to okay. focus on safety. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a single mom with one son who is eight. When we go to the grocery store, he has a huge meltdown in the store if he doesn't get a candy bar. So not only do I have to deal with him, but everyone in the store is staring at me and I'm really embarrassed. I work so I can't go to the store during the day and I don't have anyone I can leave him with. Help! Huh, that was That's me. That's an exclamation point after the help. So let's help this poor mom out. What can we do, Amy? <laughs> I was going to say that was me 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so definitely have some suggestions here. Um, so the the I, I kind of want to approach this a couple of different ways. One, I want to teach how to set a limit, and so it's it's a three. It's really simple. There's three steps. Um, we call it the like ACT model. So we're going to acknowledge the feeling, we're going to communicate the limit, and then target an acceptable alternative. So in this situation, we're going to say, or by acknowledging it, we're going to say, I know you really want that candy. The C, the communicating the limit is going to be, but it's it's not okay to have candy before dinner. Or I mean, that's just one example we could go with. It's not okay to have candy before dinner. The T, the targeting and acceptable behavior. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. We can just say you can have and give them another option that you're okay with. What I like to do is to 
to give them two options. So they have a choice in the matter. So that would look like, you know, you can choose a banana or crackers, right? So I understand you really, really, really want that candy, but we're not going to have candy before dinner. And you could even say, because, you know, then you're, you're, it's going to spoil your dinner mm -hmm. or, um, and then give them their choice. So you can pick between this or that. Um, so that's a good way to um, set a limit. Okay. Now, another kind of the other way that I wanted to go about this is just some ideas um, for like when you are going to the store. Mm -hmm. um, you could kind of like have a list, go prepared, have a list. Um, you could kind of um, do like, you could make it a game and do kind of like a speed through your list and see how quickly you guys could get through the store. Like it's a race. Right. You, could time, you could time yourself, especially because we're talking about a little kiddo. So by playing, we're making it more fun. Um, you could do play like um, kind of like hide and seek. It's find and seek um, and mark your things off, you know, on your list. Um, have the kid maybe give them an option of what they want for dinner and then have them kind of help pick those ingredients out. Yeah. Um, you could also have a lot of fun and maybe you guys dress up in costumes. I had a little guy that came into my office the other day in a super like uh, hero outfit. It was the coolest thing. Um, I thought that was so cool that that mom let that happen. Um, and then the other part is just um, giving them more options as far as like helping pick things out. That makes it a little bit more fun for them and probably more tolerable. Right. Um, maybe even just having a little bit of a snack while they're with you. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we see that happen a lot. Yeah. Um, those, those would be some things you could do in the moment. Because there's nothing more painful for an eight-year-old than having to go to the grocery store. I mean, so really. Well, and the other thing to remember, the other piece to this is um, if they're having a meltdown and you're setting a limit, you still want to stick to that limit. I, it, we all know what it's like. We've heard it happen. We've experienced it happen. I, I've never judged another parent because of that, especially because we know when we set a limit, you know, kids probably are going to try to really kind of like balk at that. You know, they mm -hmm. they want what they want. Yeah. And you have to help them it, that it's a learning process. Give it, you know, I said no and I'm sticking to no. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Next up. When my child is throwing a tantrum, she lays down on the floor and cries and screams. She's never physical and she doesn't throw things, so that's good. But I'm never sure how to react. What should I do when this happens? Should I ignore it? Should I respond? And if I should respond, what should I do or say? Okay, so I I don't, I'm not going to encourage you to ignore this. I think that that can lead to some other issues. So it kind of goes back to some of what I talked about earlier and just being present with them. Mm -hmm. And so like being there with them, um, again, really checking yourself, making sure that, that you're regulated, using a soft but firm voice, encouraging some of those calm down things, you know, breathing. Right. Um, the other, like some, some verbal things that you can say to help them calm down and to know that you're there is it's okay to feel this way, like to acknowledge, like, they may, you know, at that age, they don't always know what's going on, you know, like, I, mean, I have a lot of kids that say, you know, like they, they don't know how to, they're just so full of energy and they get upset and they, they have a hard time coming out of that anger mode. Um, you know, say I'm here if you need me. Um, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, again, not really going to want to dive into that conversation until we're definitely calmed down. Um, but letting them know, you know, I'm here. I want to help solve this problem with you. Um, Let's see. You can tell them, you know, like, um, it's okay to take a little bit of time. You know, you can either, I can stay here with you or I could be right outside the door. Just let me know what you want. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me, you know, are you able to think of some words to tell me how you're feeling? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also okay to let them know, you know, listen to your body, you know, it's, it's okay. And, and talk to them. Where do you, where are you feeling this anger right now? That's really important too, um, to help them realize, um, you know, cause our bodies give us a lot of clues when we get angry. A lot of times we feel it in our face, we get hot, we can get headaches. We start to clench our jaws and we grip our fists. Like, we can walk them through all of that. Okay, cool. Thank you for the examples too. That's really helpful because I wasn't sure where you were going. Um, uh, my teen sometimes lashes out in difficult situations, but he's rarely an angry kid. Are there other issues that sometimes look like anger, but there's something else? Yeah, so, I mean, for sure, it's kind of, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Again, there be some some underlying issues um you know adhd um depression so with adhd you know a lot of the times we can become irritable because we you know we we can't um filter you know all the stuff that's coming at us Mm -hmm. it's just hitting us all at once so we get really frustrated and then we lose track and we forget things um depression a lot of times comes across as anger because we're kids are irritable. That's generally how we see depression in kids is more like that irritability. They can still be sad and weepy and whatnot, but the big difference between adults and kids with depression is usually with kids, it's more irritability. Um, Again, I talked about sensory overload earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the tags on clothing, different textures, the, the thing at the end of the sock can all really irritate kids. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, by now that's been a personal experience of mine <laughs> with the sock. Um, Socks so, are tough when you're little. That's, that's <laughs> a serious business. It really is. My my kids had the same issue. It was more anger. Why can't I put this on? And they just kind of wrestled with it. It wasn't so much a textural thing. It was just they were hard to put on. You know? yeah. 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 And that's that's good that you realize that. So sometimes I think we we as I mean, we have a lot going on as parents, and so sometimes if we can just slow down and ask more questions, and mm-hmm. and kind of get to the root of it, it really could, would make our life simpler. But I think you know we just live in a busy society, and we're trying to rush to here to there to everywhere, and we can get easily frustrated and start to dysregulate, and we create the cycle with our kids. All right. Okay. Um. Next question. Sounds like a parent of a teen. I know every teenager can get moody or mad, but how do I know when my teen might need to see a counselor? What should I watch for? Okay, so similar to like what I talked about before, when it starts to get um, physical, I would say that that would be some warning signs when we're getting physical, we're potentially putting ourselves at risk of hurting ourselves um, or others. Um, When we as a parent feel like we've tried everything and we don't know what to do. Mm. I think that's a really good indication when you just don't know what to do at that point and you start to, you're starting to question yourself and not know what to do and feel worried and scared. Those are all definitely times that, you know, it would be good to seek out extra help. I've done mute myself. Here is a note from someone who her question is, I have a four-year-old daughter. When she was younger and would throw a tantrum, I tried to ignore the behavior and I tried not to give in. But eventually I would give her what she wanted, especially if I was tired or had had a bad day at work. Now I know that was a terrible mistake. And as parents, we make mistakes. I'm trying to fix my mistakes, but now she will cry and scream for what seems like hours. What can I do to get back on the right track? Can you put toothpaste back in the tube, Amy? What what can this mom do? <laughs> you can. There's hope. <laughs> so it's just going to be a little bit tougher. I mean, I'm just being honest, you know, but when I gave that example of the ACT, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Setting, setting a limit and then sticking with it. We have to do the follow through. You know, she answered it herself. While we all understand why, when we say no, and then, you know, we get this behavior, and then mm-hmm. we give in, we have taught them, we've 
taught them and modeled, this is what I have to do to get the answer to change. Yeah. And so what we have to do is be consistent. And then all the different things that I've talked about so far would be extra things to help through that process. Mm -hmm. so during that tantrum, there's all those things I've been talking about that, that you could do. Okay. Now, generally what happens is if you're sticking to it and you're doing a good job of setting that limit and not giving in, things will get, they'll get a little bit worse, a little more intense mm -hmm. before they start to get better. Right. So, so just remember that it's, it's important to remember, but eventually it will start to get better if you stay consistent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, three more questions. Uh, again, if anyone wants to submit a question through the chat, please feel free. We'd love to take it. Um, my teenage daughter seems angry and anxious all the time. What can I do to help her get through this? So I think I think a good thing to share is that developmentally, like when we get into preteen and teens, it's all about the social aspect. Like that is where their focus is at. And so I think it, it's, that's a rough time with development, you know, worrying about friends, peers, what they literally, they're just, you know, teen, teens are programmed to think that their peers are all staring at them and watching them and judging them. And so they're, they're going to have some extreme reactions, I think. Um, also there's hormones play, play into that. Um, so just understanding, um, and then being, again, being there using some of those phrases I suggested, even with the younger kids can be said to teens, we might just tweak the language a little bit, but you know, I'm here for you. Right. You know, if you want to talk when you're ready to talk, um, you know, offering, you know, support that way. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm a single mom. Well, I'm not a single mom, but. You know what I mean. Uh, this mom says, I'm a single mom with little support. My son is 13. He's always depressed and angry. He outs at, acts out at school and at home when he gets mad. I don't know what to do to protect his little brother and sister and myself when he lashes out. He's almost as big as me. What do you suggest? And we kind of hit on a scenario like this early. You want to just kind of hit the highlights? Yeah, I again, I think this is a good, this would be a good one to ask for maybe some professional help. Um, but in those moments, again, really just having the little ones try to get to another room, um, close the door, just just some distance. Um, again, don't poke the bear in the moment, really give them some space, let them know you're there to calm down. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times um, when we kind of poke at them and we um if, if we start to dysregulate again they just kind of match that energy that we're giving so those are areas to just really focus on right and is it is it too simple to think if my child is going to learn how to be calm i need to be calm myself you have to model that behavior is that too simplistic or so i mean you will have like i mean you will have occasions you know, where you may be very calm um, and your child, for whatever reason, doesn't, isn't calm. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is something to um, modeling what we want to see. Mm -hmm. And I guess some examples that I can think of is, you know, a lot of the times if I have kiddos that come in here because they're anxious, mm -hmm. most of the time their parents are. Um, yeah. A lot of the times, you know, when, when I'm working with kids and families and, um, if the kid is a yeller, most of the time it ends up coming out, but that's just kind of, you know, like that's what's happening at home. Like right. we're, we're frustrated and, and we're, we're, we're acting that way. So it's not all the time, but I really do think it's a big part of it. Like we mm -hmm. really just need to stop and think, um, you know, what we're doing because our kids look up to us. Right. You know, yeah. and and they're with us a lot, and we just, you know, yeah. I think we do influence a lot. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last question of the evening. My daughter has low self-esteem, anxiety, and depression. She lies to me a lot, and she's just angry all the time. How do I know if it's teenage hormones, like we talked about earlier, or a real concern? Yeah. 
Yeah. So the first thing I want to kind of touch on, because I think that it becomes hard for parents, that lying piece, she lies to me. So if you think about it, most of the time, if we, if we're lying about something, it's usually because we don't want to either hear what someone's going to say back to us, or we feel guilty. You know, there's, there's usually a reason. And so, um, Again, I think if you start asking more questions, really being involved, um, you know, I think spending time, I think it's really important to try to spend that quality time with our with our kiddos um, when when they're down. I think it can really make a difference um, showing up for them. So I think we, I mean, I'm going to say, I think we should take all of that seriously. Again, there's hormones all the peer stuff that's going on, you know, lots of, of pressure in the world. Um, I don't know. I, my teenager told me a couple of years ago, mom, you have no idea how hard it is to be a kid these days, you know, and, and I believe him, you know, probably is really, really hard. I thought it was being, it was hard being a teenager too. And so I think that we just need to show up and be there to hear them out. And not just assume that all teenagers are trying to manipulate us. Right. Okay. That's it for the questions. Anything you want, any final remarks or anything, anything you want to say? A couple things. Just um, sometimes I think we just need little words of encouragement. So sometimes um, what I, another thing I want to say is, you know, focus on the donut, not the whole, you know, and so I think that sometimes it also can become just so overwhelming to us you know we've got all this stuff going on and we don't know where to start so focus on your kiddo you know start there and then work out um I also what I like to share with parents is before we can correct we have to connect so I think starting with a healthy relationship you know, being like we talked about being present, putting the phone away, making them a priority. And it doesn't have to be 24 seven. We're working, we're busy, but, you know, making sure there's that one-on-one -on -one, like special time, mm -hmm. you know, um, checking in with them first thing in the morning when you get, when they get home from school or when you get home from work and then before bed. You know, like, even if it's just a couple of minutes each time, that's, that's a, a great thing. Okay. I think the more, the, the more positive relationship that we have with our children, all of this stuff, just, I think just, um, you'll feel better. Okay. Um, the other, the one last thing that I, I wanted to kind of touch on is when kids are scared, they often go into like fight or flight mode, which, um, is really just, that's our brains. That's the part of the brain that's assessing for safety. And so um, if we yell, if we yell as parents, if, if that's how we're handling behavioral type situations, um, our kids are gonna clam up. They're not gonna be as open to talking to us. And so again, focusing on ourselves is important. Mm -hmm. You know, really focusing on us and making sure that, that we're supported um, because it's not easy being a parent. Yeah. Definitely not easy. Right. And like I said, when we started, it's the toughest job in the world, especially now. So Amy Carr, LMSW, thank you so much. That was fun. Lots of good information. Thank you so much for spending time with us and for, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, if you want to review uh, a specific question or just the whole presentation, we have been recording it. Uh, that will be up on our website. Uh, fsgctopeka.com. Probably, hopefully, I'll have it up tomorrow around lunchtime. Um, just go to fsgc fsgctopeka.com, and right there on the homepage, there's a big blue box that says Parenting Resources. Click it. You'll see Ask a Child Therapist near the top, and you'll see where not only tonight's presentation video is, but our three uh, Ask a Child Therapist videos that uh, Amy did for us earlier in the month. Um, on that same page, just so you know, you're also going to see our entire library of real-world parenting videos on topics like anger management, ADHD, uh, medications, myth versus fact, those kinds of things. Feel free to check those out. You may find something interesting. 
Uh, next year's topic, next year, next month's topic is self-care for parents and caregivers. Um, and it's not just for parents and caregivers of kids dealing with mental health issues. This is a hot topic for parents too, because a lot of parents really struggle to take time out to do something for themselves, even if it's take a 10 minute walk. Um, so Karen Smothers, LSCSW, um, is going to talk about that. And it's gonna be a really good session. That's Thursday, February 23rd. Um, if you wanna see the complete schedule of Ask a Child Therapist presentations, again, you can go to our website and click on events up at the top and it'll pop up and just scroll down a bit and you'll see that calendar. Um, again, Amy, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks to folks who joined us. And uh, I hope we offered you some information that you can use. So we hope to see you again. Thanks very much and good night.